I was kind of hoping we had another song. <laughs> no, come back. But then I'll go over anyway. Well, I love this time of year, not just for the warmth, and I do love the warmth, but um, the new life that emerges. It really does appear that life emerges out of the cold darkness of winter, does it not? And I think that's God's illustration for us of the importance, meaning of resurrection. I hope you understand that the resurrection is not just an historical event. It's important for you. God wants you to understand it for you, for your children, for everyone that is around you, that you have personally grasped the meaning and can rejoice and can exude a joy because of what the resurrection actually means. Do you remember the last time you went to a funeral? And you're at a funeral and they laid the body to rest. You put that body in the ground and you ask yourself, apart from the resurrection, where's the hope? Where's the future? It's just not there. I've done funerals and I've been at a funeral where there is no hope. It's gloomy. It is bleak. It's not something you want to really be a part of. When they laid my father in a casket 30 years ago, I remember, I'm a kind of an emotional guy, and I remember exclaiming out loud, one day that casket is going to burst open and my new dad is going to come out of it. And I wanted to remember what that casket looked like because I, I'm going to get to see that one day. Nothing short of victory over death. That's what the resurrection of Jesus should mean for you. You, newsflash, are going to die one day. I hope it's not before me. I hope that you have a long and prosperous life, but you are going to die one day. And what then will you do? Think that's it? Think that's over? It's all over with? No, there is judgment after death. There, you will face God. He made you. Your soul will fly back to him. You will face a day of reckoning. And that day of reckoning you cannot avoid just like you cannot avoid death. Where's the hope in any of that without the resurrection of Jesus? Paul wrote about Christians who died in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. He said this, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. So you want to know where the body of Jesus is? You just told. It's in where? Heaven. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. I imagine that will be very loud. And with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. In other words, you won't beat them. They will beat you into the kingdom. The dead in Christ will rise first. And then he said, I want you to take these words about the resurrection, the resurrection of your future loved ones, and comfort one another with those words. It's comfort because it happened and it's going to happen. It's not deception. It's comfort. The bodily resurrection is what sets Christianity apart from all other religions in the world. Think of a religion. Think of some philosophy of life. Think of some splinter religion. Think of whatever you want. Do they have a resurrected leader? Do they have a resurrected Savior? Modern-day Judaism gets to continue their traditions and proclaim a law, but it doesn't raise anybody from the dead. Islam gets to proclaim the words of a dead prophet. Not really too much in that. Buddhism gets to proclaim that middle path of moderation, meditation, an escape from all desire, but no victory over man's greatest enemy, which is what? Death. Hinduism proclaims many gods and all their karma, either good or bad, and and the great joy of reincarnation. Which one of their gods has power to grant life? None of them. Don't tell me all religions are the same. I'm sick and tired of hearing that. They're not the same. We proclaim victory over death, the body remade supernaturally out of the ground, not because it's wishful thinking, oh, gee, that would be a nice idea. How would that survive for 2,000 years? How would that convince skeptics just a wishful idea? We proclaim it because Jesus actually did it in human history, and nobody else did that, just Jesus Christ. Pastor Adrian Rogers, 
great Baptist pastor, is quoted as saying this, The resurrection is not merely important to the historic Christian faith. Without it, there would be no Christianity. It is the singular doctrine that elevates Christianity above all other world religions. There you have it. Happy Easter. When the secular media and Hollywood or National Geographic or whoever's putting out the latest junk about the life of Jesus and their so-called historical documents ignore all of the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' resurrection and they do that to try to cast doubt on Jesus' resurrection, they have to resort to all kinds of skeptical speculations and wild theories. They cannot depend on facts. We have history. We have facts. We have prophetic prediction on our side. Not to mention change lives around us. Jesus Christ lives. He still changes lives today. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. We know that. What is so great about the resurrection? John Stott put it this simply. We live and die. Christ died and lived. That about says it all, doesn't it? And still, the moderns are skeptical. How can you believe in a man raised from the dead? I mean, that never happens. Precisely. It never happens. It never, ever happens. It's the one great sign that God gave to the world. Everybody else dies. Do you know why they die? Because God's not pleased with their life. He takes life from them because they're sinners. There's one life he was pleased with. He went and died, not for his sins, but for whose? For ours. And then God said, that life is too good. I'm going to raise it from the dead. And he raised him from the dead. It's the one miraculous sign everybody is to understand. Listen to Jesus. Follow Jesus. He has life. He has your future. He's your judge. He's everything. That's who he is. The evidence for Jesus' resurrection is as solid as the rock tomb they laid him in. And then that tomb was empty. Every time I read some skeptic's explanation about how the Christians started this story about the resurrection, my confidence in the resurrection only increases. Is that the best you got? They went to the wrong tomb. They all had mass hallucinations. The whole thing was just a myth and a legend made up, despite, of course, all of the early documents and the first century eyewitnesses. It goes on and on. The disciples stole the body. The Romans took the body. The Passover plot. Honestly, all of it has been long refuted by scholars much smarter than I am. After researching the historical evidence for the resurrection... And writing the book, by the way, this is a, book, a good book to get and read if you want one, The Case for Easter, and it's not about the Easter Bunny. <laughs> Lee Strobel, an investigative journalist, wrote this. In short, I did not become a Christian because God promised I would have an even happier life than I had as an atheist. He never promised any such thing. Indeed, following him would inevitably bring divine emotions in the eyes of the world. Rather, I became a Christian because the evidence was so compelling that Jesus really is the one and only Son of God who proved his divinity by rising from the dead. That meant following him was the most rational and logical step I could possibly take. Good words. Sometimes it is willful and foolish to remain a skeptic. Billy Graham once said, There is more evidence that Jesus rose from the dead than there is that Julius Caesar ever lived or that Alexander the Great died at the age of 33. Yet everyone accepts those as facts. To that we can add the testimony of the New Testament, Romans chapter 6, verse 9. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. That's why we follow him. He conquered death. Ain't nobody else did that. My friends, do you see why we have such good news to tell the world? There will never be better news than what the Christian church has for this world. Jesus crushed man's biggest enemy, death. 
You would think the way the church is treated these days in America by the secular elite class that the church was a plague to be avoided. But Jesus is no plague. He is the cure for all of life. Come to him. Come to him, and he will grant you life. There's one short passage in the New Testament that explains the good news that includes the resurrection, and I'd like you to turn to that passage now in your Bibles if you have one. If you don't, just look on with somebody. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to read verses 1 through 8, but we're going to focus only on the first four verses. 1 Corinthians, that's Paul's letter to the Corinthians, and it's chapter 15, the great resurrection chapter, and verses 1 through 4, but I'll, I'll read through verse 8. Paul is writing. He says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel, which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Verse 3, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, As to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Paul being the last new eyewitness to the resurrection. If you have ever wanted to know how can I be right with God, how can I be sure I have a personal relationship with God, how can I make sure that when I die I'm received into heaven, you just read the good news there in verses 1 through 4 particularly. There it is. The answer is there for you if you'll pay attention. Here it is called the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is a pretty big deal. Romans 1, Paul said that his life was set apart for the gospel of God. His whole life was set apart to promote the gospel of God. Pretty important. And here Paul declares his intent in verse 1. He says to them, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel. If you're someone that likes to witness to other people, you need to know what the gospel is. Well, here Paul says, here's the gospel. Can't get any clearer than this. The gospel is the angelion in Koine New Testament Greek, the original language of the New Testament. It means simply this, the good news. Not the bad news, the good news. It's what it's all about. It's supposed to be good. And that's what I want you to understand today. It's good news. First, I want you to understand how important the gospel is. That's in verses 1 and 2. And then I want you to understand what the gospel means. That's verses 3 and 4. You got it? How important is the gospel, verses 1 and 2? And what does it mean, verses 3 and 4? Hang with me because I think this is important. First, how important really is it? Look at verses 1 and 2 there. And actually, at the beginning of verse 3 says... Paul writes that the gospel is of first importance. He uses the term there, protos, meaning first, or better yet, it can be translated preeminent or prominent. In other words, the one great priority of the church is, and a lot of people fill in other things for this, they have all kinds of priorities. I don't know what it is, you know, getting rich or something like that. No, the one great priority of the church is the gospel. If there's one thing any church, that church on the corner and that church on the corner of there has to get right, it is the gospel. Shut the doors down if they don't get the gospel right. Notice Paul said that the gospel is important enough to preach. He said, which I preach to you, Corinthians. That verb preach is yangalidzo, and it means to announce the good news. Some people these days, they don't want anybody preaching at them. I guess that's not you because you're letting me preach at you today. But some people don't want anyone to preach with them. But we have to preach because it's good news. How can we keep our mouths shut? I mean, tell us to keep our mouths shut. Are we going to keep our mouths shut? I'm sure they're being told that in China, keep your mouth shut. Are they keeping their mouths shut? No, they're spreading everywhere the news about Jesus Christ and the communist Chinese government doesn't know what to do with them. They have like some hundred million believers now there, right? Keep your mouth shut. We're not going to do that. We're going to keep preaching. 
The gospel is supposed to be announced. It's a public proclamation from God to all the nations, all the ethnic groups in the entire world. Somebody, yes, he was a Jew, a Jewish man from the city of Nazareth has conquered the greatest enemy of man, and it's not aliens. It's death. He's been beaten, and Jesus did it, and nobody else did. So pay attention to Jesus, follow Jesus, listen to Jesus. Notice also the gospel is important enough to be received. It says, which also you receive. Receive means that they believed it. They welcomed the good news to themselves. Unfortunately, a lot of people hear the good news today and they say, well, I'm glad for you Christians that you have a nice little story to believe in. But they don't receive it. They never say, I want that for myself. Some people are intrigued by it. Some people study it, but they never receive it for themselves. If you had deadly cancer in your body, as I do, and someone came up with a pill that could kill every last cancer cell in your body, it wouldn't help you at all unless you took it and did what? Put it in your mouth and received it, right? There Jesus is ready to grant you everlasting life, eternal abundant life forever and ever. He's proven he can do it. And yet you won't receive him. You won't receive the gospel of Jesus Christ for yourself. How foolish is that? It doesn't help you until you receive the gospel. That's what faith is. Believing the promises of God. God promises new life. And you believe that, you receive that. Jesus said to Martha in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life I mean, what kind of an arrogant man would go around saying that, by the way, right? I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even if he dies, he will live. What an amazing statement. He's either wacko or he's God, right? God walking around in a body. I take the latter option. This also says the gospel is something in which you stand. Now, I'm standing up here. You guys are all sitting. But standing is a good thing. Standing is in contrast to falling. When you fall, that's not good. When you stand, that's good. The gospel allows us to stand. You say, stand where? Stand in our position before God. What does that mean? That I would be welcomed by God. That I can stand in God's presence and I won't be blown away in the judgment. There are a lot of people out there. They're trying to be good religious people or nice people, even if they don't go to church or synagogue or mosque or anything like that. And they think they'll be good enough. And one day they'll die and they know they have to face God or whatever God is like and some idea of God. And they figure they'll go up to God and they'll explain about their life. But they won't stand in God's presence. They will be blown away because of the holiness of God. Psalm 1 says, The wicked cannot stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. When God speaks in his holiness, their sin will be uncovered and they will not be able to stand. They will fall. They'll be swept away. That could be you also. You could be swept away in the judgment of God. But the gospel allows you to stand in the presence of God and be received. Why? Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When you are in Christ, you're safe. You're impregnable. You're protected. Before what? Before God's anger and wrath against the sin of this world, your sin will not be counted against you because of the good news, the gospel. That's what it is. This hope is rock solid. In the gospel, we stand firmly. Notice the gospel also saves. Verse 2, by which also you are saved. There are a lot of witches in this verse. I don't know if you noticed that or not. It's describing the gospel. Which, which, which. Not witches, by the way, but witches. There's a lot of witches. Saved is another witch. We are saved by the gospel. Sozo is the common verb for spiritual salvation in the New Testament. It refers to being saved in the whole sense. Our souls are saved now. That is, we're forgiven of all of our sins. Our souls are redeemed. Our bodies are not yet saved. I mean, look at it. It's not saved yet. One day, our bodies will be saved. Our bodies will be included in God's whole plan of salvation. He's going to save body and soul. He's going to save the complete you. And it's the gospel that allows us to be saved from the wrath of God. Sometimes people hear about being saved, and they kind of turn their ears off. Can I restate that a different way? You are safe in Christ. Safe. Again, safe from what? Safe from God. People have way too tame an understanding of God these days. God's all love. God's all mercy. 
No, God is not all love. There is this thing called holiness in the Bible, justice, the anger he has against sin. It's all over the Bible. I don't know how people miss it, frankly, when they read it. It's, well, that's the Old Testament. That's all over the New Testament too, my friend. God is holy. He has righteous indignation against every single sin that we commit. Why doesn't he destroy us? Because he's also loving and patient. But that will all come with a fury upon sinners like you and me unless we're safe. And there's only safety inside of who? Christ. That's the good news. God does punish people. There is eternal danger. In fact, Hebrews 10.31 says it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But you can know today that you're saved. Listen to this. Romans 10.9. Here's a promise from the Bible. If you will confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, that means you're ready to follow him. He's your master. He's your king. If you'll confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, not some Lord out there, your Lord, and... If you will believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the promise of God. I I believe God raised him from the dead, and I confess him to be my Lord. God's going to save you. You say, but that seems too easy. That's the good news. It's not easy from Jesus' side. He had to suffer and bleed and die. It wasn't easy from God's side. It's easy from our side. He offers you everlasting life. That's good news. The Bible says there is not one completely righteous man anywhere in the world. Not one, except for him. And that's why only he can save you. And we have to believe and accept that gospel. Paul ends verse 2 with a warning. Basically, he says, I gave you this gospel, I preached it, you received it, you stand in it, you're saved by it, but you have to keep it. You can't believe in vain. That is, people that started to believe and then they walked away from it. You have to keep your faith to the end. That's what a true believer is. We've all seen people that they come down an aisle, you know, or they go to Billy Graham crusade and they seem to get saved. Or maybe you had that earlier in your life and like you think you're saved because you did something in a religious surface. But if you, if you believe... God says your belief has to be the kind that you continue to believe. You continue to walk with God. Believe is in the present tense. That means you believe and you keep believing. It's not one time I believe, one time I did something nice, one time I sang in a choir. You know, it's no, I believe and I keep believing. And it's not your good works anyways that gets you to heaven. It's Jesus' work that gets us to heaven. Many people have professed Christianity. They've even been baptized. They've gone to church. But if you don't hold on to the gospel, if that's not your treasure... If that's not where your faith is, there's going to be no salvation for you in the end times. That's how important the gospel is. Now, what is the gospel? Second, the meaning of the gospel. Look at verse 3, would you? He talks about, I delivered to you as of first importance what I received. By the way, in the book of Galatians, he makes a big point that he did not receive this gospel from any other human being. He says, I got it directly from Jesus as a revelation from him. I received that gospel directly from Jesus, and I turned around and I delivered it to you. He said, I'm not a chef, I'm a delivery boy. I'm just a UPS man. I took the truth and I delivered it to you. And now you have it. That's all that I am. Now listen to it. Here's what it is. And it has four parts to it or four components to it. Component number one, Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That's part number one. That's the good news. Christ died for for our sins according to the scriptures. Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, died. This is the normal word for physical death, and it's in the past tense, so it's recording history. It was already accomplished by the time Paul even wrote this. Jesus was divine. Jesus was also human. So in his humanity, on that cruel Roman cross, he actually bled and died. The Muslims are wrong. The Muslims said he didn't die on the cross. They they wrote 500 years after it happened, the people that were standing at the cross said he bled and he died. They even put a spear in his side to make sure that he was dead. He died on that cross. Now you say, what? I don't get the good news. A good man was killed on a cross? That sounds like bad news. That doesn't sound like good news. No, 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 no. It does not say Christ died. Read the verse again. It says Christ died for what? For our sins. Say that with me. For our sins. That's the good news. 
your sins, your ugly, miserable, rotten, stinking sins that you try to hide. I try to hide them also. We all try to hide them. We don't want anyone to find out about them. He knows them, and he hates them, and yet he already died for them to forgive you. That's good news. You get it? Is that clear? He died for you. Man, you can't beat that. That's good news. That word for, if you want a little more technical understanding, is the Greek uh, preposition huper. It means on behalf of. It means he died as a sacrifice, as a substitute for us. We should have gotten blasted by God. Instead, God blasted him with our sins. The penalty for sin, according to God, for one sin, the penalty for sin is what? Death. You all knew that. Physical death, that's why we die, because our first father, Adam, sinned, and now we all die because he sinned. Bum deal, right? But we all are made alive, not because we did anything good, but because one man did something good, Jesus. That's a good deal, isn't it? Bum deal, good deal. Okay, that's how it is. In Adam, all die. In Christ, that is, everyone in Christ, all are made what? Alive. That's how it is. But it's not just physical death. The Bible says if you don't turn away from your life of sin and come to Jesus, when you die, you will die in your sins. You will be in your sins, the position in your sins. Your sins will have you and own you. And you will die in that position. I had someone tell me, if God is true and Jesus is true, I'll receive him after I die. No, you won't get that opportunity. You'll die in your sins. You're locked in now. It's, a, it's over. There's no, there's no chance after death. That's it. You heard. You had your chance. It's all over for you. You'll die in your sins. And then what will happen to you, the book of Revelation calls, is the second death. You Wait, how can you die a second time? <laughs> yes, there's a second death, and it's not funny. It, that's called the lake of fire, and it says anyone who is not in Jesus was thrown into the lake of fire. That's in Revelation chapter 20. The death of Jesus fully paid for all sins of anyone who puts their confidence in Jesus, but not for anybody that refuses to come to Jesus. You live for yourself. You live for your own pleasure. There is no forgiveness of sins for you. In Romans 5, 8, it says, God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, that means lawbreakers, Christ died for us. But there's more. It says Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That's plural, graphos. That even adds to the good news. You ask why? Because the facts of the gospel are not just facts of history. It was something that God planned. Jesus died for our sins according to a plan, according to the scriptures, according to prophecy. It was all laid out ahead of time that he was going to come into the world and he was going to offer his body as a sacrifice and he was going to save any who believe and that's what he did. And so now we know it's all locked in. It's all guaranteed. This is the way it was supposed to happen. That adds to the good news. Jesus kept telling his disciples before he went to the cross, we're going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be killed. We're heading up to Jerusalem, I'm going to be killed. And they didn't get it. They didn't get it. They didn't want to hear it. After he was killed and after he rose from the dead and he appeared to them, it says, he said to them, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, Jesus explained to his disciples all the things concerning himself that were written in the scriptures. It was all according to the scriptures. That's component number one. Component number two is in verse four, and that he was buried. Jesus was buried. You ask, wait, is that part of the good news? He just said he was making known the gospel, right? And he said he was buried. So you know what I'm concluding up here? The burial is part of the good news. Do you ever share the burial with anybody when you go out witnessing? The good news is this. Jesus was buried. Actually, Paul lists the burial of Jesus as an essential piece of the gospel. Did you know that all four of the gospel accounts, all written in the first century, give careful and explicit detail to the burial of Jesus of Nazareth? We are told how Jesus died on the cross. We are told 
Who took the body down from the cross? We are told. Who wrapped the body? We're told. Who prepared the spices? We're told exactly where they laid the body, who was present at the burial, the cloth they wrapped him in, the rock that they rolled in front of the tomb, who owned the tomb, the Roman seal put across the tomb to guard it, and the soldiers that stood guard at the tomb. Every detail. Jesus was thapto. He was buried. He was a human being, and he was buried in a rock-solid, rich man's tomb. The burial is important for this reason. The burial confirms to us that Jesus actually, what? Died. He died and he was buried. He was buried and put into the ground. It showed us he was truly a man. It showed us he was truly dead. It showed us his body was protected by a tomb. It gives evidence to the bodily resurrection of Jesus. That's component number three. And now we crescendo to what we all want to talk about at Easter, right? And look at it. And, so we've got two already, right? He died, he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scripture. This is uh, what Paul really accentuates in this entire chapter, this long chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus was raised. Egero is the verb. It's a normal word to refer whenever Jesus was talked about as raised from the dead, miraculously. Here, Paul uses the perfect tense of that verb. Yes, verb tenses matter in Bible interpretation. The perfect tense stresses the historical completion of the fact and the present reality due to that fact. In other words, Jesus was risen and he remains and stands risen to this day. It happened in the past, but the results continue all the way to today. He was not raised and then died again. That would be Lazarus. Lazarus was raised from the dead and that was an amazing sign, but the poor guy had to die a second time. That was Jairus' daughter. You know, she died early. Jesus had compassion, raised the little girl from the dead, but she had to grow older. We don't know what happened there. Maybe she died of something later. But she had to die, okay? Jesus rose from the dead never to die again. When we say he is risen, we mean he's alive in his body today, and we will see that body. In fact, just to belabor the point, the same body that died is the same body that was buried is the same body that was raised out of the tomb and is alive today. The body that hung on the cross is the body buried is the body that walked out of that tomb. There are many counterfeit Christian movements out there called religious cults. They seem to sound a little bit like Christianity, and they fool a lot of undiscerning people. One thing that the cults all have in common is they deny Jesus' bodily resurrection. They say, oh, he rose. You listen to the Jehovah Witnesses. Oh, he rose. How did he rise? Well, he rose in his spirit. Well, what did they do with the body? I guess they just threw it out back somewhere or something like that. That's not good news. How is that any different than any of us, right? When I die, my spirit, I'm told, is going to leave my body, and my body's going to go kaput. And I'm going to rise up in my spirit to go be with the Lord. How is that any different than anybody else? That's not good news. How do you even see that to know that that's good news? What is the good news in saying Jesus was raised spiritually if his body stayed dead? How would we know he defeated death? No, listen, Jesus was raised bodily, and he was raised bodily, notice, on the third day. It does not say 72 hours later. It says on the third day. So how does that work? The Jews, and this is common knowledge, counted any part of a day as a day. So Jesus was buried on Friday. It was towards the end of Friday, but before the sun set. 
so they count Friday. He remained in the tomb on Saturday, that's two days, and then he was raised very early on the third day, on Sunday, on the third day. Jesus even named the day that he would be raised, Matthew chapter 16, 21. From that time, it says, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. He named the day. And that's amazing. He didn't just rise from the dead. He named the day he would be raised from the dead. The third day is Sunday. I say again, happy Sunday, happy Easter. Dr. Grimaki wrote this, if Christ had been raised from the dead on the second, fourth, or any succeeding day, that would have been a remarkable, unprecedented achievement. But it also would have declared him to be a false prophet. Because he named the day of his resurrection and he accomplished it on that specific day, the third day. All of this was predicted in advance also by the scriptures. David, in Psalm 1610, in the Old Testament, 1,000 years before Jesus was even born, said, as he spoke and uh, spoke of his greater son, the Messiah to come, you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, the place of the dead, nor will you allow your Holy One, that's the Messiah, to undergo decay. Jesus was buried long enough to prove he was dead dead but not long enough to allow what decay to set in that's why it had to be the third day now listen guys some people are so confused about this resurrection thing even though i feel like it's so clear but they're so confused by this i want to take a moment just to explain what the resurrection is not okay The resurrection is not the same thing as the immortality of the soul. When the Apostle Paul arrived in Athens and he spoke to all of the great Greek philosophers on Mars Hill and he went on talking about things, if Paul had stood up and said, you know something, after Jesus died, his soul left his body and it it went up into the spiritual places and it lived on forever, all of the Greek philosophers up there would have applauded and said, that's exactly what our philosophers believe. We believe in the immortality of the soul, that the soul lives on. But that's not what Paul said. Paul said, God has furnished proof to all the world through a man whom he appointed as the judge of all the world, and he raised that man from the dead. Well, as soon as Paul said... He raised his body from the dead. All of the educated men started sneering and jeering at him. Ah, that never happened. The immortality of the soul was something many of them believed in. Oh, we will all live on the immortality of our soul. That's not good news. Everybody believes that. This is the body is raised from the dead. That they could not accept. And that's what you have to accept to be a follower of Jesus. The resurrection is also not reincarnation. Yes, I have to bring this up. Reincarnation, if it were true, is a trapped cycle. Do you know what it is, right? It's just recycling human beings. They just keep coming back as something else. If you do bad, you come back as a, as a what? A cow, you come back as a frog. God forbid, one of those insects in the backyard, something like that. You keep coming back and you have to suffer it again and again. How long? I don't know. How long ever it takes for you to reach perfection? That's a works-based thing. That is not good news. That is very, very bad news. And you're you're a human being. The only place you can go from here is down, right? You've got to come back lower as an animal. I got two gerbils. I would hate to be in a cage with the gerbils. Come back as a gerbil, you know? A dog would be low enough. But there's no hope in that. It's a cycle over. Resurrection is not reincarnation. Reincarnation is bad news. Resurrection is... Good news. Resurrection puts an end to all suffering. The resurrection is also not resuscitation. Resuscitation is when they take those two electronic things, I forget what they're called, and they put it on the guy's chest and it goes zoom, and the body goes like that, and the guy that's been dead for a few minutes or a few seconds, he comes back and, oh, we see that blessed heartbeat again, right? 
And some of them have written books about what they saw when their spirit left their body and they started floating down the hallway and they heard the nurses talking about them. This, that poor guy just died in room 13. And they come back and they say, I'm not dead, I'm back in the body. And they had a resuscitation because they weren't brain dead. They were around for a while. They went up to the fifth floor of the hospital. They went down and saw the people in the snack room. I don't know what they did, but they never made it to heaven. They were resuscitated. Resurrection is dead, 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 brain dead, dead. I don't know how to say dead better than that. Do you have a better way of saying dead better than that? He was dead, and then he was brought back to life. That gives me hope because that's where my body's going to be one day. This, guys, is the greatest news ever. If you give any thought at all, philosophically, to the predicament of human beings on this planet, you'd have to say, wouldn't it be great if someone solved this death problem? You know, you get in a car accident and you try to make sure you have good insurance to take care of this car problem, right? You get a toothache and you go to a dentist and hope they're going to take care of your tooth problem. Why don't people turn to the expert to take care of their death problem? Because Jesus can take care of your death problem and nobody else can. Don't hold back. Don't hold yourself from him because you're too proud. Don't say, look, I want to live my life my own way. You're not going to get to live your life your own way. You're going to die. And it's all over then. It's better to admit you're wrong now. Join the rest of us. By the way, this room is filled with a lot of people that admitted they were wrong. You know, we blew it. We sinned. Uh, I could tell you about my sins, but I don't really want to. (laughs) He asked my mother. She'll tell you about my sins. We're all sinners here. Uh, Some of you may have indulged in gross sexual sins. Some of you may have done something very embarrassing. Some of you may just, you don't want to let go of what your mother and your grandfather told you that was different than what you heard today. You know, you got to let go of that. And you got to come to Christ. You have to come to him to receive life. And when you receive life from him, then you have everlasting life. There's a fourth component to all of this that I... It really goes on to talk about in the rest of the chapter, and we don't have time for it. And that is the fourth component of the good news is that Jesus appeared. We don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus merely because there was an empty tomb. That's a good start. But we believe it because Jesus on that very day appeared to the women, first to a woman, by the way, which is a very bad idea if you're in a male-dominated society that doesn't even accept the testimony, the legal testimony of women, that your first eyewitness is going to be a woman. But Jesus gave that privilege to a woman who cared for him deeply, Mary Magdalene, and she was the first eyewitness to see him. She thought he was the gardener at first. She wasn't even anticipating a resurrection, right? And there there he says, Mary, and immediately she recognizes his voice and says, Rabboni, that is teacher. And she clings to him and, and he says, stop clinging to me. I'm going to ascend to my father. But go and tell the brethren. And then he appeared to that group of women we'd read about in the Gospel of Matthew. Women, women, to begin with. Women believed it before men did. Very bad idea if you're trying to make up a story and win people to Jesus in a male-dominated society to start with women witnesses. Very bad idea. But the story starts that way because that's the true story. And the women sometimes were more insightful about truth and Christ appeared to them. Then he appeared to the men. And the men saw him, and there was one man, and I have to say, he bore my name, Thomas, or I should say I bear his name, and he's really known as what? Doubting Thomas, right? And he said, because the other ten got to see him, and he didn't, Judas was gone, he said, unless I put my finger in his nail mark, unless I put my hand in the side where the spear pierced him, I will not believe. Jesus appeared to him and told, Thomas, stop your doubting and believe. And you say, well, I wish that I had the opportunity that Thomas had. Well, you don't. (laughs) But what he said after he spoke to Thomas was, blessed are those who have not seen, not seen, never seen, and still what? Believe. Believe. That's your blessing. Thomas didn't get that. And so you can believe today. 
and you can have everlasting life. In closing, I'd just like us to stand. We'll have our benediction if you stand with me. And we'll give glory to Christ. And uh, Doug opened our service with, He is risen, He is risen indeed. If you believe that, if you don't believe it, don't say it. But when I say He is risen, if you mean it, say it nice and loud. Bring the roof down if you want to, okay? <laughs> and then I'll say a closing prayer He is risen. He is risen indeed. That was good. Lord Jesus, thank you for being our living Savior. Oh God, thank you for sending your Son to love us and die for us. Help those that are skeptical to see they're running out of excuses. Help them, Father, to believe this day, to get down on their knees and confess you as Lord and Savior. Help them to turn to one of our leaders, one of our people here, just to get their questions answered if they have some, because they're good questions, but they're also good answers. Help them. Help anyone that's listening to us, Father, right now to receive newness of life through Jesus Christ. We pray it in his name. Amen.